You came. Thank you so much. I'm actually really honored to be here. So thanks to Chad and Ben uh, and to the O'Reilly team for inviting me. Uh, you're not going to believe this, but I know other speakers dream about you know speaking at TED and going to Davos and whatever. Uh, but I've been sitting by my phone for a long time, being like, when am I going to get invited to RailsConf? And I know you think I'm kissing your ass. So it's but it's really it's actually the truth. Um, there's something, and I work with startups. I do this thing called Lean Startup, which you'll get to hear about more than you ever dreamed. But Rails has done more for startups than like a whole boatload of venture capitalists. Rails has had an incredible impact on the startup ecosystem, and I see it every day. Uh, but I learned a, a tip from Gary Vee, which is make sure they know who the hell you are before you start talking. So I write this blog called Startup Lessons Learned. Uh, anybody, any readers in the audience? Can I see? Whoa, hey, thank you. Thank you very much. That's exciting. Uh, for the rest of you, how many of you are entrepreneurs or in a startup right now? Can I just a quick show of hands? Wow, OK, yes, thank you. That's what I figured. Um, everywhere that I have seen Rails uh, proliferate, of course, especially in Silicon Valley, um, startups spring up everywhere. And I just wanted to share a few thoughts about why that is. The Lean Startup is now a movement, a worldwide movement, as you heard. I've been traveling all over the place. Uh, talking about a different way of building startups, a different way of thinking about entrepreneurships, uh, entrepreneurship, and I think it's uh, very compatible with what you guys have been talking about in the Rails community. I say you guys because I'm kind of a faker. Uh, I used to be an engineer. I was CTO of several companies, most of which have failed. Hi, I'm a professional startup expert, but most of my companies have failed. I know you're not supposed to start that way. But that's the truth. And anyone who's willing to tell you the truth about entrepreneurship, not the stories you read in the press, but the real stories, you're going to see there's a lot of failure. Um, so, you know, when I actually wrote code, there wasn't that much Rails uh, going on. And now to see it grow into such an incredible community has really been cool. See, I, I told you you think I was kissing your ass. Sorry. Uh, let's just do some quick ground rules. The first is, uh, who has a mobile phone? Show of hands. Just kidding. Just seeing if you're paying attention. Could you take it out of your pocket and make sure you turn it on? So phone's on. I do not want your undivided attention. Please tweet amongst yourselves as much as you like. All I ask is that you use the Lean Startup hashtag. Uh, while you do so, then you can join the worldwide uh, conversation about Lean Startup. OK, fair? Um, I have this new book coming out. And you know, when you're writing a book, you're pretty much obligated to go everywhere and tell people they should buy your book. It's coming out in September, but don't worry. You can pre-order it now at lean.st. Uh, I can wait while you do that. Just You can all take a moment. It's fine. I, don't, I really don't mind. No, I appreciate everyone who has pre-ordered. Uh, it's an incredible, uh, incredibly supportive. Thank you. Um, but I did want to just give a quick shout out to um, Pivotal Labs, who built this website for me at lean.st in Rails, of course. Uh, it's hosted on Heroku. So thanks to Pivotal and Heroku. My friends at Pivotal heard I was going to be speaking here. And they said, listen, uh, if you just so happen to run into a couple of thousand Rails developers, could you tell them that we're hiring? So Pivotal's hiring. Just I thought I'd plug that. Um, lean.st is not just a website to sell the book. It's also a fully featured experimental platform for testing how to sell the book, because it's Lean Startup, as you'll see in a minute. That's what we're all about. Uh, and so we have built it uh, to make experiments on you as easy as possible for us to run, to learn the most. Uh, and if you do pre-order at lean.st, you can actually go behind the scenes and see every single experiment that we have run, all the data about uh, how customers have behaved. You actually watch us experimenting on you in real time. So you can do that at lean.st, and I'll stop plugging things. Um, these are some principles from the book that I wanted to share with you. Uh, entrepreneurs are everywhere. Entrepreneurship is management. This thing called validated learning, the unit of progress for startups. This feedback loop we call build, measure, learn, and then something called innovation accounting. And at this point, I should probably apologize, because you came for an exciting talk about entrepreneurship, which is like the coolest topic ever. And now I'm telling you we're going to talk about management and accounting, which are probably the most boring topics imaginable. So I apologize. But I actually think if we're going to get good at entrepreneurship, we have to make it a lot more boring. So here's what I mean. Who saw The Social Network? Just a quick show of hands. Right? OK. Uh, who saw Ghostbusters? Two great entrepreneurship movies. People forget that about Ghostbusters. <laughs> Most of the plot of Ghostbusters, for those that remember, is concerned with these crazy guys with this new technology get thrown out of a university and how they're going to build their fledgling business and make it be successful. And like all great entrepreneurship movies, Social Network included, uh, it's a story in three acts. So act one, the plucky protagonists and their uh, character strengths and defects, which will be very important in just a moment, uh, how they had the great idea and maybe how they got their first customer. And then we shift immediately into act two, which I call the photo montage. Usually lasts about two minutes. And it goes, you know, usually on the social network, it's like them pounding on keyboards. They chug some beers. In Ghostbusters, they bust a ghost or two. And then all of a sudden, they're on the cover of magazines. Uh, and everything's really successful. And then we go into act three, the really interesting part, how to divide up the spoils, who sues who, and what happens to the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. 
and that is an exciting story. Those movies are great movies for a reason. And when you read stories about entrepreneurs in magazines everywhere, you see those great stories. It's really fun. And so you, I have this question, which is, how come the photo montage is so short and it has no dialogue? When, in my opinion, every important decision that determines the outcome of a success or failure of a startup happens during the photo montage. And the answer is because all that work is too boring for the movie. I mean, who's ever sat through a product prioritization meeting? Anybody? Right. Does that seem like movie material to you? No, of course not. And yet product prioritization decisions, what features to build and not build, which bugs to fix, which customers to listen to and who to ignore, those are the really important but really boring topics of entrepreneurship. And as an industry, we have to get better at not just doing that stuff but also talking about it. Because the exciting stuff, how do you get your great idea? You know, how to divide up the spoils? I know those of you who are entrepreneurs already have you know, worked it out in great detail. What are you going to do once you get very rich? And these are very important questions. They're very exciting. They're like the 5% of entrepreneurship. And yet the 95% is the boring day-to-day -day mundane details. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So sorry to disappoint if you were looking for something exciting. Um, entrepreneurs are everywhere. What's amazing about asking that question, hey, who's an entrepreneur? People ask people to raise their hands. I've done that in countless cities and countries around the world. I've never once had someone say, excuse me, I'm not sure whether to raise my hand or not. Everyone thinks they know what entrepreneurship is. You know, if I'm doing that crazy thing like in Ghostbusters, then I'm an entrepreneur. And if I have a regular job at a normal office, you know, then no, you know, no pole to slide down, then not. And yet, I think we need to do better than that if we're going to start making our practice of entrepreneurship more rigorous. So here's my definition of a startup, a human institution designed to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. What I think is most important about this definition is what it omits. Nothing to do with how big your company is, what sector of the economy you're in, what industry you're in. If you face the conditions of extreme uncertainty, which are the soil in which startups thrive, then you are an entrepreneur, whether it says that on your business card or not, which is all just a fancy way of saying that a startup is an experiment. But unlike in past eras, today, our experiments are not experiments in can something be built, right? We're not trying to figure out, hey, can we make the flux capacitor work? The question is, should it be built? Can we build a sustainable set of products and services around this idea? That is the question of entrepreneurship. And since uh, we're faced with that question more and more, especially as our technology gets better and better, we can pretty much build anything that we can imagine. So that means that our future prosperity Unemployment crisis, GDP, everything will depend on the quality and effectiveness of our collective imaginations, which is kind of a strange place to be. And the problem is that we are wasting people's time on an industrial scale because most of the startups that we build are a complete and total waste of time and are doomed from the beginning. So those of you who raised your hand, who are entrepreneurs, thank you so much. You are changing the world, most of you, and yet most of you are going to fail. And I think that is something we can do something about, but just in case you weren't don't believe me about the whole failure thing. I, I, maybe you've heard entre entrepreneurs are a little bit optimistic. I brought a demonstration. So we know that most startups fail. Anyone here remember Web 2.0? Remember when, when Web 2.0 was really cool and uh, those of us in the Valley were busy hyping the hell out of these companies and um, pouring way too much venture capital into them? Uh, this is a graphic that was made in 2006 by a designer who was really excited about the potential of Web 2.0. And then in 2009, just three years later, a different graphic designer was feeling a little bit different when they put together this graphic. Here's our three-year report card in Web 2.0, uh, and it's pretty sad. Most of those companies have failed, and I don't think they failed for good reasons. And I think we have to start to ask ourselves, why are we building so many companies that fail? You know, it's not like, everyone understands entrepreneurship is risky, but it's not like we're trying to build quantum teleportation here. We're building things, especially in the software industry, especially in Web, web 2.0, everything we, we can imagine, we can build. So why are we choosing to build things that nobody wants? That's what we're going to talk about. So it has to be somebody's fault. Uh, you know, most of my startups, have, all these startups are failing. Obviously, it can't be my fault. <laughs> uh, preferably, it'd be somebody who's dead, uh, so he can't argue. So I blame Frederick Winslow Taylor. Uh, this is the father of so it's called scientific management, what we today call management. Uh, and Taylor is famous for a number of ideas, most of which we consider to be too obvious to imagine them ever being invented like that uh, managers should divide up work into tasks and delegate those tasks to functional specialists. Or that my favorite, what he called the task plus bonus system, which we just call tasks, that if someone does their task especially well, they should be paid a bonus, not penalized. See, in the 1910s and 1890s, they would penalize you if you did a task better than expected because that meant you were sandbagging. You're a person of low moral character that you've been doing it the slow way all this time. 
you can imagine the kind of workplaces that that engendered. And yet, when you, the more you read about craft production, about the kind of production that existed before Fred Taylor, the more it sounds suspiciously like the way we manage programmers today. And I think we are basically living in the craft production, the pre-scientific age of entrepreneurship, and that is on the brink of changing, and you guys are part of that, which we'll talk about. Uh, so what I said I would talk about is that entrepreneurship is management. I know it sounds strange, but it's not the general management of Fred Taylor. It is a new kind of entrepreneurial management, a management discipline specifically for that context of extreme uncertainty I mentioned before. Uh, and the most important entrepreneurial management concept is the pivot. I'm sorry for those of you who are sick and tired of hearing about pivots uh, already. Uh, it's kind of gotten out of control. I saw this in the New Yorker magazine the other day. Uh, I'm not leaving you. I'm pivoting to another man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I never intended, I didn't imagine, you know, we, none of us in the Lean Startup Movement thought this would become jargon, but the reason it's such an important concept is that this is what true stories of entrepreneurship looks like. Remember that in Ghostbusters, you know, they're practically on their last dollar. They're about to go bankrupt when their first customer finally comes in. And you think about it, if Zool decides to show up in New York a year early or a year later, there's no Ghostbusters, they're out of business. Right, that's actually what usually happens in entrepreneurship, and we need to structure our company so that uh, that wouldn't be so devastating for the city of Manhattan. If you look at the real story, you'll discover this weird zigzaggy path between the initial idea and the successful idea. You ask yourself, did successful entrepreneurs have better ideas than unsuccessful entrepreneurs? I say the answer is no. They're equally crazy. It's just that successful entrepreneurs, when they run into difficulty, they don't just give up and go home but neither do they persevere the plane straight into the ground. They do this thing called a pivot. They change some elements of the business while keeping others constant. They keep maybe a new strategy for achieving the same vision. So you pivot the strategy, you stay true to the vision. And the premise of the Lean Startup is this. If we can reduce the time between pivots, we can increase our odds of success before we run out of money. Because what matters in the startup runway is not how many months of burn you have left, it's how many pivots do you have left. And if we can learn to pivot faster, we magically increase our runway without having to raise more money, or maybe without having to raise any money at all. So let's talk about validated learning. Uh, when I was trained as an engineer in Silicon Valley, I was taught the waterfall methodology of software development. This may be familiar to some of you. This is straight out of Fred Taylor. I was taught it as the manufacturing metaphor of software development. You can imagine how pissed off I was when I found out that they don't use this in manufacturing anymore. <laughs> So it's not clear to me why we're using it in software. So I hope none of you are doing this, but maybe you have a friend. And the problem with traditional product development, waterfall style, is this. It allows us to achieve failure, to successfully execute a bad plan. See, if, if we really believe that most startups are failing because they're fundamentally building something that nobody wants, then why are we so proud of having done that on time and on budget? You go to startup board meetings, what are we talking about? We're talking about milestones and plans and forecasts. But plans and forecasts are tools that only work if you have a long and stable operating history. Anyone here feel like the world is getting more stable every day? No, tools and forecasts, plans and forecasts are no longer useful guides, especially for startups. So what we need instead is something a little bit more adaptable. Now, most of you are probably thinking this. This is uh, agile product development. I was a, a devotee of, of extreme programming, and I think one of the reasons why Rails has been so successful is that as a community, uh, you guys have adopted a lot of techniques out of this playbook, which are much better than the old waterfall thing. And you've changed the unit of progress. See, in, in, uh, in waterfall, the unit of progress is advancing the plan to the next stage. That's what makes achieving failure possible. You, you feel like you're making progress, even though you're busy building something nobody wants. Uh, we've changed in Agile the unit of progress to a line of working code, but when I was at IMVU, that's the last company I founded, we built this 3D avatar instant messaging add-on. And the idea was we would take the technology of virtual worlds and bring it to IM, and customers would love it, and it would spread virally throughout the IM networks. It had to be an add-on because everyone knows uh, IM has network effects, and therefore you can't just bring a new instant messaging network to market because the, everyone's already on an instant messaging network, and so to switch, there'd be high switching costs because they have to bring their friends. Uh, you know, that's kind of st standard strategic analysis. And so we said, all right, the brilliant way to get around that is to build an add-on. And to make a long story short, uh, we shipped this product. It was super buggy, super low quality. I mean, I was really embarrassed even to put it out there. But we, we really didn't want to have make the mistake of building something nobody wanted. So we actually were charging people money for this crappy product from day one. I was really nervous. We finally shipped it. And luckily, nobody used it. So at least nobody found out how bad it was, and we weren't embarrassed. But then I started to have this really nasty thought, which is, wait a second. Uh, why, wh if, you know, why do we do that? Why were we arguing every day for months about which bugs we absolutely had to fix when customers wouldn't even discover that the product could crash their computer? 
Uh, and to make a long story short, we had to pivot the business away from the instant messaging add-on and towards a standalone network. And um, my code that I had written got thrown away, thousands and thousands of lines. So maybe you can sympathize with me for a moment, OK? Because I had written all the software, and I got thrown away, yet I had done it all agile. I had good test coverage. It was well factored, if I do say so myself, et cetera. And yet the good code and the bad code all got thrown away equally. And so then I was like, gosh, did the company need me at all? Like, why was I here? Well, couldn't I have just been on a beach, you know, on vacation, drinking, just sipping a nice drink uh, while the company went ahead and did this? And I said, no, no, no. Uh, if I hadn't been there, if we hadn't built this thing and shipped it, we wouldn't have learned this very important thing about customers, namely that they thought the instant messaging add-on concept was stupid and refused to use it. So that was good to know. I mean, that was excellent. I'm glad we found that out. But then I started to have this really nasty thought, which is like, well, but wait a minute. If our goal the last six months was to learn this important thing about customers, why did it take six months? I mean, we had supported like, I don't know, 12 different instant messaging networks for interoperability. My question was like, would the learning have been the same if we'd supported only six with half the code? Yeah. Only three with one quarter of the code, right? What if we'd only supported one network? Would we still have discovered that customers don't want to download our software? Of course. And then I had this thought. This really freaked me out. I was like, hold on. What if we hadn't built any software at all? We just created one single web page that said, Here's the screenshot of this product we think we're going to build. Would you like to download it? Would we even have had to create page two, where we apologize that the product's not available? Or would a 404 have been sufficient? <laughs> 404 would have been fine. Why? Because they didn't want to download the software. That means they wouldn't click the download button. And I was really depressed. I mean, I was just, wait, hold on. How is it possible? My, my business card says chief technology officer. And how is it possible that my work for the last six months could have the same value as a three-hour web page? that a designer whips up. That doesn't seem right to me. Uh, and that was the beginning of a journey that led me to Lean Startup into this concept called validated learning, that what really matters in a startup is not how much stuff we build, but if we can learn how to build a sustainable business. Uh, here is customer development and agile development put together into this company-wide feedback loop of learning and discovery. Simplified, it looks like this. A software company is nothing more than a catalyst that turns ideas into code. When customers interact with that code, then we can collect some data, qualitative and quantitative, about what they think, about what they do, about how it works. And then we can choose to learn, impacting our next set of ideas. That's a pretty simple three-stage feedback loop. Build, measure, learn, we call it. And yet, as technologists, if we're going to do entrepreneurship, we have to get serious about this simple heuristic, that our goal should be to minimize the total time through this feedback loop. And this is where I come to my point about why Rails makes startups. Because what matters in a technology platform for entrepreneurship specifically is not how scalable it is. It's not how much fun it is to write code in it, although I hear Ruby's very fun. It's not uh, you know, how many different people you can have concurrently working on it. It's not does it have a really beautiful syntax. It's not even is it very writable or is it very readable. Actually, all that matters is how flexible is the platform. And again, not for just making stuff, building to the specification. How flexible is it for our ability to learn from customers, learn what is working and what isn't. And it's not just the technology itself. It's the technology and the community together that make a platform what it is. And if you have a community that embraces not just making cool technology, not just having the kind of libraries that allow you to test new ideas very quickly, not just ideas from agile development that allow you to build your software with higher quality, with better organization and better factoring, but that embraces the entire project of very quick prototyping, learning, testing, reacting. You can get through this feedback loop faster than anybody else. And the reason I believe that startups are using Rails is not because it's better technically, but because it's better at this. And as technologists, this is the question we have to answer for entrepreneurship. Or like I said, anybody who finds themselves in a, po in a position of facing extreme uncertainty, how can we become as adaptable, learn as quickly as possible? And so if you talk to enough entrepreneurs, if you read enough entrepreneurial magazines, you know, you're just, you'll start to see this really weird pattern. Startup advice is ridiculously contradictory. It's like, listen, uh, everybody knows that you know, really good design is critical to success in entrepreneurship. Steve Jobs would never ship a product that didn't have great design, except if you're eBay or Craigslist or MySpace, uh, when they didn't have really good design, because actually it's more important that you get your thing out there real quick and have customers use it. But make sure it's really scalable, otherwise you'll be the next Friendster, uh, unless scalability actually doesn't matter that much, in which case don't worry about it, because Facebook was able to scale up later. And you know, make sure that you listen to your customers, unless you're doing newsfeed and customers don't know what they want, in which case definitely don't listen to your customers. So you should definitely 
importantly, have good design, but not good designs. Be scalable, but not too scalable. Make sure you listen to your customers and also ignore your customers. Good luck. Uh, and as an entrepreneur, that kind of stuff used to drive me crazy, because it's like, well, which, which of you should I listen to? We should have a board meeting with advisors, and they would all, everyone would give us their opinion, and sometimes our, you know, our CEO would be like, okay, CTO, you heard all that feedback, now go implement it. I'm like, but, but that was like four, four ways contradictory. <laughs> He's like, that's your problem, not my problem. Uh, and welcome to being an entrepreneur, right? If, if people give you contradictory feedback, that's your problem. You don't get a gold star for listening to customers. You don't get a gold star for building product. You don't get a good star for making money necessarily. My belief is you only get a good star for results. And the results that matter are not, hey, can you make a lot of money today, but can you figure out how to build a sustainable business for the long term? Now, there's a lot more to Lean Startup. There's all these techniques you can read about. Uh, probably the most controversial in our pantheon is something called continuous deployment. Uh, at my last company, InView, and a lot of other companies now, we're putting software into production like 50 times a day on average. The lights are too bright, so I can't see. I know there's always a few engineers that start shaking their head at this point. They're like, that does not seem like a good idea. You know, right? Think of all the things that could go wrong. Just indulge me for a second. You know, like uh, someone, some random engineer could just take the site down. We used to let like QA people, designers, and marketing people, anyone who wanted could have their own sandbox and chip code to production anytime they wanted. And our point of view was, listen, if it's so easy to take our site down that even a designer, even a marketing person can do it, then shame on us. But I hear that doesn't seem like a good idea. You know, what if, what if an engineer or some random person regresses an old bug by accident? Or my favorite, takes the checkout button out of the e-commerce flow. So now your, uh, your website, you know, your, your business has become a hobby. <laughs> not, not actually that fun. That kind of thing can happen. But continuous deployment and all of these techniques are disciplined methods for avoiding those kinds of problems so that then your team can operate with maximum speed and maximum courage. Because you all know, there's tons of features out there that take longer to prioritize than they do to build. You know what I'm talking about, right? And so for those features, instead of arguing all day about whether to build them or not, let's just do an experiment to get ourselves through this feedback loop quickly and discover if we're right or not. And then we have facts, and we can actually do science, not astrology. It's pretty exciting. Uh, and just to close my example about continuous deployment, you know, sure, it's pretty easy to have functional tests that you know, detect if the button is missing, something like that. Just try this on for size. Instead of, as our little like, April Fool's joke, instead of taking the button out of the e-commerce flow, we'll just change it to be white on a white background. Anyone ever had that bug? You know, the button's still there. All the functional tests pass. It works fine. It's just no human beings can see it, so business equals hobby. Uh, at InView, if you went back in time to my desk and we actually did that prank, check it into my sandbox, in the next 20 minutes, we would get an email back. It'd be like, dear Eric, this is your cluster speaking. Thank you so much for trying to check in change 1,421. Uh, turns out that that's a really bad idea. So we've automatically reverted that change. We've automatically notified the team that this happened, so so much for my prank. And also, we've shut down the line. This is an idea right from Toyota Production System, you know, the famous Andon cord. We made it impossible for anybody else to check in or deploy till a human being gets to the root cause of what went wrong. So it's not a very good prank. What it means is that we're building products that have an immune system that can automatically detect the most boneheaded and stupid mistakes so that we can clear out our fear and act faster. Now, in regular engineering, most people are like, ah, who cares? Yeah, OK, so yeah, that might be marginally better. But you know, it's more efficient for me as an engineer. I can build faster if I don't have to waste time you know, getting all this feedback from customers. Engineering in stealth mode is the most fun. We all know that engineering is the most fun if it wasn't for those damn pesky customers always getting in the way, right? So if we can clear out all that building and measuring and learn, if we just, just build, we can be more efficient in the same way that uh, if we want to drive our car as quickly as possible, the fastest way is just to close your eyes and floor the accelerator. Uh, if you want to get the car in motion fastest, that is. So I want to mention one last thing, which is innovation accounting. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but um, we, we can talk about it in the Q&A if you guys are interested. Instead of doing product milestones, we need to use learning milestones. And so instead of saying, hey, here's a specification, let's go build it out as quickly as possible, we need to work backwards from what are we trying to learn and what is the minimum viable product to learn that thing. That way we can establish real baseline data about the I was about to say crap, but really, the crap, it's in our business plan, right? We all have a business plan. It has a spreadsheet in the back, and it says, you know, in some tiny little cell in two-point font, it says 10% of customers who see our sign-up page will actually sign up. That's a leap of faith assumption that should be, like, printed out in giant, bold red letters in the business plan. Like, by the way, if 10% of customers won't sign up, then we have no business. But we, we like to hide it and bury it in the spreadsheet. So let's make those assumptions really explicit, and then let's go find out what's the truth of that right now. 
How many customers right now will sign up for what we're building? And if it's 0%, if it's 5%, if it's 50%, it doesn't matter. Getting the truth is more important than having good news. And then once we have that baseline established, then we can try to tune the engine to make changes to our product and actually find out if they're making the product better or worse. Most of the startups that I have worked with, most of the product development teams I know, most of the features that they add to their products actually make it worse, not better. So we can stop doing that. And of course, the most important thing, if it's not working, if we're getting diminishing returns on those efforts, then we can decide that we either need to pivot or persevere. You can schedule that meeting in advance. We can say, instead of saying, well, we'll meet about it, we'll decide to think about a pivot only after we fail, or if we fail, right? <laughs> if we fail. How about we say, look, we're probably going to get some things wrong, so let's decide 12 weeks from now. Let's have a meeting. At that meeting, let's talk about whether we're going to pivot or whether we're going to persevere. So I've left a number of questions unanswered, like how do we know exactly when to pivot? The relationship between vision, strategy, and product. What exactly should we measure? Uh, how is it that products grow? How do we know if we're creating value or just building a great Ponzi scheme? What sh specifically should go in the minimum viable product? And of course, as we scale, can we go faster instead of suffering the inevitable fate of bureaucracy? Um, I've left those questions unanswered because I hear there's this really great book coming out uh, really soon. Of course, you should all <laughs> pre-order it as soon as possible. Thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I have the world's most overqualified mic handlers, Ben and Chad, have volunteered to do that. So please, I, I can't see because of the lights, but I, if there's questions, please feel free to come up and ask them. While they're doing that, I'll just mention we have a new Lean Startup website up at theleanstartup.com. And of course, we're doing startup lessons learned in the conference uh, this coming Monday, May 23rd. And if any of you are in San Francisco, you're cordially invited. We'll also be simulcasting uh, in more than 100 cities around the world. So wherever you are, it's very likely that you can attend for free. So do we have any questions? Hey, hey Eric. Um, my question to you is this. It seems that um, people have taken uh, your idea and sort of perverted it in, in a way that's, so it seems like there is no design, uh, there is no upfront uh, planning, uh, there is no business plan. It's sort of like, kind of we are, we're just gonna hack away and you know pivot 15 times yeah. and guess what? There's, there's VCs who are willing to fund that uh, right <laughs> now. Uh, what do you say to them? Yeah, thank you for that question. First of all, there's VCs ready to fund anything right now. Let's just be honest, okay? Uh, and just, you know, those of you who, who like, um, who like uh, uh, George R. R. Martin will know what I mean when I say that winter is coming, <laughs> so, so be ready. Um, but yeah, this kind of perversion. Look, every idea uh, gets misunderstood. Uh, I, I think I even have this, this graph. I, I get this question a lot, so I have a graph ready for it. Everyone know the Gartner hype cycle? <laughs> Uh, you know, when something happens, we reach the peak of inflated expectations, uh, and then we hit the trough of disillusionment when, it when we find out that it won't like, wash my car and make me live forever and give me quantum teleportation. So uh, we're kind of in this peak at the moment around Lean Startup. And uh, I mention that because, from my point of view, being misunderstood is a huge step up from being ignored. So I really appreciate that they were achieved that level, but I think we can, of course, do better. And this idea that, uh, you know, that it doesn't matter if you have design, it doesn't matter having a business plan, I just think that's really wrong. I hope from this talk you can get a sense of why. If your plan is to ship it and see what happens, then you are guaranteed to succeed at seeing what happens. But then what? Right? As soon as you have three customers, you already have five opinions about what to do next. Uh, and the worst thing that can happen to you, actually, if you ship it and like everything blows up and nobody uses it, like what would happen to me at Inview, that actually is a blessing. The worst possible fate is you ship it and you have a little bit of success. You have some customers and you have a 4% sign-up rate. And it's like, well, is 4% good or bad? And then you work on it some more and you get the sign-up rate from 4% to 4.1%. And you're like, hey, we're making progress. And then it goes up to 4.15% and then 4.17%. I meet teams like that that are really proud about every little uh, increment. And yet the problem is, they have no idea if they're actually making progress. Because maybe to make a successful business, it needs to be 10%, and getting from 4.1 to 4.11 is not progress. That actually means you're doomed. Or maybe 4% is great, so you don't know how to evaluate what you do. Anyway, ship it and see what happens is not science. Right? If, if people did chemistry the way that we do entrepreneurship, most chemistry labs would explode. <laughs> it's just like throwing stuff around to see what happens. No, science is make a prediction about what's supposed to happen, and then if it doesn't happen, that sets you up to learn something really interesting. So uh, I think the role of design, business strategy, uh, those topics are really important for helping us understand what questions need answering. What do we need to learn about as quickly as possible? That's, that's what I think. Um, we have time for one more? Yeah, right over here. Okay, um, great. In the graphic you showed with the uh, 
all the Web 2.0 companies have failed. I was yes. just wondering, do you know how many of those companies failed because they were just giving everything away from for free and hoping for ad revenue, and they just didn't actually, you know, they couldn't actually stay it that way, or because they had a product that nobody wanted? Yeah, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question specifically. Uh, you know, I haven't conducted a, a in-depth survey about it. My sense is that it's not that nobody used their product. I mean, it's actually very rare to get exactly zero people. The real issue is that uh, the model that is supposed to support your product doesn't work. So, for example, people look at these successful companies and they draw, I think, the wrong conclusion. So you, you look at something like Facebook, which didn't charge people money from day one. You say, ah, that, you know, therefore don't charge money from day one. But the idea that you just get big fast and kind of hope for the best is kind of ridiculous. And yet sometimes it works. And there's a question, well, how come it worked for Facebook, but it didn't work for all these other companies? And I think the answer is that uh, there's a concept in the book I talk about called engines of growth, that a product which is designed to grow virally is really different than one that grows through paid advertising, is really different from one that grows through engagement or sticky, what we call compounding uh, interest. And depending on which engine of growth you're using, the metrics that are critically important uh, are different. And so you need to know what you're trying to accomplish in order to tell whether you're making progress. I mean, a lot of dot-com failures, a lot of Web 2.0 failures, tons of venture back failures that are quote unquote getting big fast are basically paying money to acquire customers' attention that they then plan to resell to advertisers. So just glorified middlemen. But that doesn't make any sense. If you're paying money for advertising, you better be creating value for customers in a way that they're gonna pay you more than that. And if you make more money per customer, then you actually and then it costs you to acquire them, then you can actually grow. Otherwise, you're doing that old grocery store joke of losing money per item but making it up in volume. Uh, it's ridiculous. I think that's the problem we've been having, uh, certainly in Silicon Valley, certainly during summer when money is flowing, you know, people feel like they can, uh, they can invest in anything and it'll work out. You know, we all know what's coming. Uh, that's why we need innovation counting. That's why we need a, me a mechanism for telling whether we're on the brink of success or actually on the brink of failure. Hi, I was uh, wondering if you had any tips on continuous deployment uh, when it comes to bootstrapping it and not necessarily having enough users to do accurate split tests. Yeah. Um, having, to, having a pathetically small number of customers is awesome. Hey, startups, you're always in a rush to get tons and tons and tons of people and attention. It's like, no, that's actually not an advantage. Having a small number of customers means you can get to know each customer extremely well. So you can actually learn a lot more about them than those of us who have zillions of customers that have to rely on all these summaries and charts and metrics that they're all designed to hide the customer from us look, so we can look at spreadsheets. And I have to teach you know, people who have that problem, we have to do the saying in Lean Startup that metrics are people too. So like, remember that there's human beings behind those numbers and, and act accordingly. If you have a pathetically small number of customers, the imperative for continuous deployment is much smaller because the consequences of failure are practically non-existent. Who are you going to piss off? You just said you had a pathetically small number of customers. So instead of worrying about split testing and continuous deployment and all this stuff, focus on, as Steve Blank says, getting out of the building and getting to know those customers extremely well. Hello. There you yeah. go. Yeah, thanks for uh, for your blog and everything. It's been I've been uh, an avid reader, and oh, in fact, so I implemented a lot of the continuous uh, deployment stuff in previous companies. But uh, the question I have is, um, what advice would you give? You're obviously speaking to a bunch of engineers, um, <laughs> and what advice would you give to a bunch of engineers who probably a lot of us have aspirations to be entrepreneurs and to have our own businesses or run some, to you know to the pivots, are they always, you know, is it people? Is it DNA? Is it sometimes, I mean, you can get a bunch of engineers in the room and you know, maybe <laughs> we're pivoting on, you know, how to refactor code perhaps. And uh -huh. you know, what kind of advice would you give to surrounding yourself maybe with a more balanced team or a group? And what advice would you give to an engineer who's seeking that? No, thank you for that question. Look, this, most people don't want to tell you this, but balance is crap. Seriously, I know everyone's like, make sure you have a business co-founder, make sure you have exactly the right DNA in your team, and you have the right astrological signs and your balance and all this stuff. And the reason we're so focused on that is that all we have today, the only data we have is we look around at the companies that are successful and we see that balance. But for every example of a balanced team, I can find you an unbalanced team that did just as well. So I think as engineers, we shouldn't be ashamed of the fact that we have a certain mindset. You guys know what I'm talking about. Other people have names for it that are not as nice. Some of them are clinical, but we, you know, we are who we are. <laughs> and as an engineer, I always felt like the thing that got me into entrepreneurship and into this, the thing that really pissed me off was I kept building products that nobody used. Okay? I mean, it just kept happening to me. Right? I kept building products, working on teams where we just had the smartest, most talented people, just spending tons and tons of time and energy on stuff that didn't matter. 
And as an engineer, that offended my sense of efficiency and just my sense of justice, that that isn't right. So what I would say is you got to start you gotta really think about whatever your job title. When you become an entrepreneur, I don't care what it says on your business card. Really, your job title is entrepreneur. Okay? And the definition of entrepreneur is person who does whatever it takes to be successful. That's it. So like whether you used to write code for a living or do marketing for a living or whatever, now your job is to do whatever it takes to be successful. And if you can get really serious about saying, how do I know that what I'm working on right now actually matters to anybody? Right? Now, I hope it matters. I think maybe it will. Then you can start to take those engineering defects and turn them into strengths, right? Because we are maniacally focused on things like efficiency. Some say a little bit too much. But we're just used to thinking about local efficiency, like how good a coder am I? Because that's what we've all been promoted on. That's what we get our raises for. Under Waterfall, you can win an award and you can be promoted for de developing the amazing architecture for a product that never ships. That's ridiculous. So in entrepreneurship, we can't do that. We have to get serious about how do I know in a scientific sense, how do I know that what I'm working on matters? And if you can really get serious about that question, then engineers actually are, uh, have a tremendous advantage over people who aren't used to thinking in a rigorous or disciplined way. Not to say that other functions, you know, you guys know what I mean. Um, I'll just say one last thing. If you look at the history of management, every past management revolution was led by engineers. Okay, the famous Alfred Sloan who ran General Motors, he was trained as a mechanical engineer. He ran a ball bearing factory, which was bought by General Motors. Fred Taylor, who I showed you before, he was an engineer. Henry Ford, engineer. Taichi Ono, who invented the Toyota production system, engineer. There's a reason why management has always been revolutionized by engineers, and that's because management fundamentally is human systems engineering, and that's what we're really good at. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming out, and uh, be in touch. Thank you.